Thank you for joining us tonight for an artist talk with Maureen Durdak and Leah McDonald. This talk is brought to you by In Liquid and Park Town Place Museum District Residences, a premier AMCO property. Situated in the heart of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, Park Town Place has dedicated themselves to making the arts an amenity. In addition to being surrounded by neighboring arts institutions, Park Town Place has brought the arts inside their buildings through, through their rich permanent collection, regular art workshops, classes, events, artist talks, and three separate gallery spaces for rotational temporary exhibitions. The current temporary exhibition is Poised and Forceful, which highlights the work of six women artists, all of whom's work pushes the boundaries of scale and abstract style. Through their different aesthetics, processes, and materials, the united thread in Poised and Forceful is a decidedly feminine take on large scale abstraction. Included in Poison and Forceful is both the work of Maureen Durdak and Leah McDonald, who are here with us tonight. Tonight, we will start by hearing from Maureen Durdak and then move on to Leah McDonald afterwards. For the past decade, Durdak's work has employed the unique synthesis of repousé metalwork and painting. This Congress of Materials was first pioneered by Durdak and definitively established during her 2011 Fulbright Research Fellowship to Nepal, where she studied with living masters. Durdak travels widely in the pursuit of her visions. Her research has taken her to Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, India, Nepal, and the Himalayas. Durdak's work references universal paradigms of mystic archetypes. Both ancient and contemporary forces converge in her work. A graduate of both the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and the University of Arts in Philadelphia, she is the recipient of numerous honors, including the 2011 to 2012 U.S. Fulbright Senior Scholar Award for Nepal. Her work is found in numerous public, private, and university collections within the U.S. and abroad. So thank you, Maureen, for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure, Claire, and uh, I want to welcome all the audience members here and a special shout out, a shout out to uh, Rachel and Sarah Zimmerman and all the support here at N Liquid for this lovely opportunity. Poised and forceful, the work of Maureen Durdak. As Claire has just mentioned, I am the 2011 Fulbright Senior Research Scholar for Art in Nepal. My Fulbright work, the Prakriti Project, pioneered the first synthesis of repoussé metalwork and contemporary painting, and I studied with one of the finest living masters of this metalworking practice, Master Ravindra Sakya Patinapal, the son the grandson of historic master Kubra Singh Sakya. I'm the only artist working with this material synthesis. The significance of my work was recognized by the late Smithsonian scholar, Dr. Mary Slusser, internationally recognized expert on Nepal and its arts who described my work as astonishing paintings and a fecund collaboration without antecedents. Two works featured here in Poised and Forceful represent this unique synthesis. The Cantos Helios Triptych, and Ardens Mundi Three, which you will be seeing more of. Over the last decade, uh, my work has been deeply inspired by my travels in Asia, especially the Himalayas, where I conducted my recent 2011 to 12 Fulbright research in the deserts of the American Southwest. These landscapes are powerful metaphors for the universality of physical and cultural forces in opposition and integration. And my selection and application of materials are reflective of these energies in eternal Congress. Growing threats to these sublime geographies and their cultures are the ominous forces of global warming, compounded by demographic expansion and dislocation. Believing that the powerful and expressive potential of indigenous ways of seeing and knowing can be effectively harnessed to contemporary art practice, my work endeavors to engage the viewer on a visceral level, thereby visualizing and accelerating meaningful apprehension of these growing forces of degradation and dislocation and increasing awareness of the interrelationship of environmental and cultural preservation. So here we have Kantos Helios Triptych. This piece was inspired by my serendipitous discovery of a clip from NASA of the Song of the Sun, which was a, a recording of the surface of the sun and the sounds admitted by it, and a, a, a very intimate view of the indescribably immense plasmatic shootings that came from the surface. Uh, it was a, a, a very, quite a terrifying 
uh, and sublime experience. And it uh, uh, inspired me to, to create this triptych here. So what you're looking at is a diurnal um, view of uh, the sun's days from sunrise to noon to sunset. Uh, I've used the um, device of ascemic writing, which is very interesting. It's a form of wordless writing, and it's a, a, an open and wordless form of gestural um, uh, calligraphy. It's uh, a device which paradoxically creates both a vacuum of meaning and an invitation to create meaning. And the, the, the history of uh, ascemic writing is very interesting and actually surprisingly goes back quite a while to about 800 years ago uh, 800 CE rather, and starts with two, two wild and crazy Chinese monks, but that's a conversation for another time. So I've used a semic writing as a device to create the uh, intimation of poetry, of a song that the sun might sing, and extracting from each of the three works, I've isolated uh, several of the gestural forms and translated them into repoussé forms and gilded them. So we'll go on and see a little bit of a detail here. Uh, but first, we'll get an idea of the scale. Here is the triptych in situ at uh, the In Liquid Galleries. Here is a close-up of the central work, Noon. And here's a short clip of the video. And here you'll be able to see a little bit more closely some of the mineral threads that I use, the, um, the uh, aggregates of copper, uh, acrylic, and uh, crushed stone that I use to create transitions from the uh, metal sculpture to the image. And the following are a few images from the creation of Cantos Helios, the production of which was executed in Nepal. In subsequent slides, I'll share more of my work process and work within Rabindra's atelier and brief video clips. So here is just one grab of a few um, images that gives you an idea of the work process that goes into the um, surfaces on my Ripus synthesis works. In Cantos Helios, there was a particular challenge because the asemic writing elements were very small and very fine and very elongated, yet had to be essentially formed from quite heavy gauge copper. And at the lower right, I call the viewer's attention to a, an image that shows some of these isolated uh, forms taken from their matrices just prior to being bundled up uh, to be carried with me back on a plane back to the United States. In my work, the plastic potential of copper, metal leaf, and crushed stone and mineral aggregates are all explored and exploited as they integrate with the new technical potentials of acrylic paint and mediums in their engagement on the image surface. This material synthesis is valued not only for its unique sensuality, but as an evocative vehicle for visualizing and expressing the collision of cosmic forces for spiritual, psychological, and uh, physical planes. In my current developing body of work, Arden's Mundi, or Burning Worlds, my new synthesis addresses climate change, each burning world visualizing one of its many terrible faces, firestorms, glacial melt, desertification, superstorms. Ultimately, seven works will complete this series. In this powerful series of work, I unify ancient and contemporary techniques from opposite ends of the globe to create an exquisite, dramatic expression of the infinitely paradoxical nature of the universe, so says Asian and American curator Mary MacArthur. So the second work exhibited at Poised and Forceful is the third work from the Burning Words series, Desico, which represents the increasing forces that are resulting in the desertification of uh, uh, regions of the, of the globe. So here I've used a form of very deep, um, deep copper forming. Um, interestingly enough, most of the deepest forms here are no more than about two inches in depth but they really project a much, much, um, uh, much deeper uh, form to the viewer. Here you can see the work in situ in the In Liquid Galleries, and you can see Cantos Helios triptych in the, in the distance there. Be beautifully arranged, by the way, Claire. Uh, here's a detail of that work, and you can get a, a better view of the way I've combined and, um, and built these crushed stone and mineral aggregates using brushes and knives and scrapings to transition between the sculpted forms and the abraded surfaces, which reveal kind of an, an uh, excavation uh, manner of the underlying um, substructures of paint that begin the very first stages of the work. 
Here are the four burning worlds to date. The series will be eventually seven bodies of work, as I mentioned, each presenting a face, uh, in the individual face of the variable forces of global warming. So at the upper left, we have Inferno, which represents the increasing phenomenon of firestorms. Um, to the upper right, we have Conflatura, which uh, speaks to the increase of um, glacial, uh, glacial melt. Uh, we've seen Desico on the lower left, and on the lower right, we have Tempestatis, which speaks to increasing superstorms. The third work presented in this exhibition is Rudra. A Rudra is an ancient reference to what we now know as the god Shiva, the god of the Hindu god of creation and destruction. Uh, Rudra's, uh, inter uh, the translation literally of the name means the howler. And I was first impelled to do this work by experiencing the, the intensity of the elements up in the high Himalayan passes, uh, which seemed to me to be almost a personification of elemental forces. And at the same time, I love the idea of creating this phenomenon against the black void, which signifies the interior of the psyche. So here I've employed another signature element in my work, which are mineral aggregate threads. These threads are comprised of very fine crushed minerals in an acrylic suspension, and they're laid on the surface of the work a few millimeters at a time. So literally, these threads, which, which function in many ways as energy vectors fundamentally in a work, um, uh, are very time consuming. And actually, as you're looking at this image, these vectors uh, represent about a week and a half worth of a very painstaking meditative work. And here is a short video which gives you, um, which will give you an a, a good idea of the sensuality that these threads perform on the image surface. Um, they rest on top of a surface that is uh, very finely abraded and has a very subtle and lustrous refractive quality that simulates almost slate, which was what my intention and for which I worked very intimately with Golden Lab to create uh, a combination of materials that will, would allow me to do this effectively without destroying the surface. Rekuse is the ancient art, <coughs> excuse me, of creating three-dimensional form from essentially two-dimensional sheet metal. It's a practice, it, it dates from 4000 BCE. My guru colleague and friend is Newa Repuse Master Rabindra Sakya. His celebrated family of masters traced their lineage to 1564 AD. Rabindra and his two brothers are the finest living masters of Repuse metalwork living anywhere in the world today. Here is a picture of Rabindra hard at work uh, on the uh, face for, uh, of a, a large Padmasambhava statue, which you will see in a second. And I can safely say that there is no other living master who is capable of doing this kind of demanding work and advancing it to such a state of perfection. Here you can see the face resting <laughs> on the neck of the statue as it's nearing completion here in Rabindra's familial atelier. Uh, here you see Rabindra and myself flanking uh, the new um, ambassador to Nepal, uh, Randy Berry, who has become a great champion of the traditional arts and contemporary arts in Nepal. He, he took time out of his busy schedule to spend uh, over an hour with us learning about the process. And I also have a piece of work within his personal residence along with Rabindra right now, where it will remain for the completion of his tenure, which will be about three years. Uh, my association with Rabindra really first started in 2009. It progressed through my Fulbright in 2011 and 12, and it continues up until the present day where I have the great privilege of working very intimately with him and his unsurpassed uh, family of artisans. Uh, there are now presently three, ex uh, two more extensions of that first initial atelier, one each owned by his brother, and down in the lower left, uh, there is a, uh, a small image, which you can see uh, referring to the fact that his family has completed what is now a Repousse Colossus that surpasses our Statue of Liberty at 49 meters in remote Takala, Bhutan. It has a very interesting back to a story for which we unfortunately don't have time in this presentation. 
Uh, Ardens Mundi here before you, uh, Tempestatis, is uh, currently on exhibit at Pennsylvania's Art of the State in the State Museum at Harrisburg. This is my most complex work to date with the deepest forming. Uh, here you can see, uh, you get a little bit of a look at um, that work within a, a mid-stage level of its production where the individual pieces, this was all done in my home studio, not in Nepal. Uh, and you can see these, uh, how this work progresses. Here is a detail of the completed work here. And here is a short video, which will take you in a tiny tour of its surface. So here you can see how I've tried to exploit the full range of both um, thick impasto of both acrylic and crushed stone, and also um, um, used very fine mineral threads uh, lacing across the surfaces of the deepest forms and uh, how they interact with the abraded surface. Very rewarding work to engage with. Uh, this is the first work of a series, a close up, Ardens Mooney Inferno, which speaks to global warming's increasing phenomenon of super firestorms. Here's a close-up of that work uh, showing a, a detail indicating um, some explorations underway with ripping the surface of the metal. And here is another video to take you on another little intimate tour with a little bit of mood music in the background with Japanese shakuhachi. This is the second work, uh, word in the, uh, work in the series, Ardens Mundi II, Conflatura. This work is in a private collection in Bryn Mawr. It was recently exhibited in late last year, pre-COVID at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Here's a detail of that work. Uh, once again, the employment of thick aggregates of um, heavy acrylic impasto with mineral elements and very fine threads and braided surfaces. Here is the work and in installation in Downriver in the Multiverse at Hoffa. And now what follows is a brief series of uh, small videos of that courtesy of videographer Gary Warnell that I'll show you some aspects of the formative steps in the process. So what I'm going to use to, to uh, show you these processes in a meaningful way is a work that was recently commissioned by an Italian collector. Uh, this is a slightly smaller work. The, the title Aeolus takes its name from the father of the winds. So we'll start our little video tour here where I'm speaking to this work. Uh, it's not possible to visualize it with accuracy because these forms are now in their matrix. But what will happen ultimately is when I bring them back to the States and do some final refinement, they will be cut and released from the matrices. Uh, they'll be coming in the border lines here, allowing for a few occasionally strategically placed flanges to secure them onto an archival custom tondo or wooden panel, which has been prepared, painting completed to my satisfaction for the first stage. After these pieces are fixed to the surface, the final painting will begin. And at that point, the piece really comes alive and presents two possibilities. It's always my favorite ultimate stage of the painting. Here we'll see a bit of a kneeling. When working with uh, the cover ray Busse elements, a uh, constant hammering and tension on the surface creates um, the molecular um, structure of the metal to disrupt and fall into disarray. And as that happens, 
you can both hear the distress of the metal, it starts to become whiny under the blows of the hammer, and uh, it becomes increasingly brittle. And at a point where uh, it, it threatens to basically shatter, the form has to be uh, taken to the fire bed and annealed, and the heat of the fire causes the molecular structure of the metal to realign and, and soften so that it become, beca uh, becomes once again very malleable. And from there, it has to be taken to a fire bath. Uh, so the, the bath for the, uh, for the um, firing of the metal is uh, either sulfuric or hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is something that's familiar to us over here in the States. It's used to clean swimming pools. So we use a, it's a muriatic acid. We use a dilute. I have a little tank at home. The uh, fired piece has to be plunged in uh, where the fire scale is basically uh, exploded off the surface of the metal, uh, the piece being left in there from anywhere from about 30 seconds to a couple of minutes, or possibly even more depending on the need of the individual element. It's then rinsed off and cleaned under water and dried, and the whole repetitive process of the uh, working of the metal begins again, or as many times as is required. Here's a little video showing the complexity of Rabindra's work, so you can see from my smaller work to the um, uh, capability of this uh, art practice to both contract and beautiful, fine, diminutive work or expand into massive, colossal pieces. Here's an example of some of the metalworking uh, using the hammers and the tools that the Navars use. Uh, these are all handmade tools uh, made from uh, blacksmiths made from iron to the individual specifications of the masters. Uh, what you see me doing is using one of their tools on a copper element. I'm working on a sand filled leather pillow that substitutes for the traditional um, pitch, pitch bowl, which I'm very proud to say is a little technical device of my own discovery. Here is another video showing uh, a little bit more intimate um, view of those hammers. They're all double faced, so in combination with the anvils and the chisels, uh, almost an infinite permutation of, of um, uh, effects and forms can be um, created. Some of these uh, little chisels are actually made from iron nails that were used to, uh, to secure rail railway ties. The, the neighbors have repurposed them very artfully to make the most exquisite set of tools and measurable. And I am the only one outside of Nepal to have a set of genuine neighbor tools made for me by my guru, which he refers to as a baby starter set. <laughs> so, in conclusion, I, I warmly invite all viewers of this presentation to um, go and stand out of the windows of the towers at Parktown Place and look inside at the artwork. Uh, unfortunately, we can no longer gain entrance, at least at this point. Um, but this has been a, a, a wonderful exhibition. I've been so pleased with uh, in liquids um, uh, work in, in, in this re respect. And uh, I want to thank everybody for all their efforts and uh, express my unfailing and very warm gratitude for this. So in conclusion, if you'd like to learn more about me, uh, please do visit my website, which is basically my name.com. I have an Instagram account and you can find me on several pages on Facebook just by tapping in my name and search. So, Dhanyabad, as they would say in Nepal, thank you. And I turn it over to Leah. Leah McDonald is an artist and educator living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. McDonald first discovered photography while attending the Shipley School in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and went on to receive her BFA in photography from the San Francisco Art Institute and her MFA in photography with a minor in art education for the California College of Arts and Crafts. In the past two decades, Leah McDonald has been part of numerous solo and group exhibitions throughout the United States. Most notably, her 2010 exhibition, In My Body, at the Wexler Gallery that was subsequently turned into a musical and was presented at the Prince Theater in 2016. McDonald has received numerous awards, honors, and grants in recognition of her work, including the Catherine Alexander Foundation and Encausticos. 
In addition to her robust duty of practice, McDonald has a distinguished teaching career spanning higher education, community art centers, private classes, such as the one she just did at Park Town Place, and demonstrations, including for Martha Stewart TV. Leah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Claire. And of course, thank you to Elizabeth and to Rachel and Sarah Zimmerman and in Liquid. I've been a member for a long time. And I always encourage everybody who comes across my artwork and my work and encourage them to join art community, right? And to feel a part of other artists' lives and share ideas and share inspirations and creativity. I um, was born in Philadelphia where I've been now practicing, uh, our practicing artist and teacher for over 20 years. Um, I started down the path of photography as a photojournalist in my teens, focusing um, primarily on the people and struggles surrounding homelessness. Um, I realize now that at that time, that's kind of how I felt. And so my photographs were a reflection of what was happening um, for me personally uh, with my emotions and how I was viewing the world. Um, this of course is an issue that was and is extremely significant and personal. I later turned my attention to the female figure and recently um, began creating new expressions through abstraction. I did receive my, I received my BFA and my MFA both in photography um, uh, and I was living in San Francisco. So one at the San Francisco Art Institute and the other at the California College of Arts. And for anybody that might know those two schools, um, the San Francisco Art Institute was very sort of traditional art practice. So I learned a lot about mm -hmm. painting there, um, a lot about classical filmmaking and editing, like cutting eight millimeter, 16 millimeter. I learned a lot about the dark room. Um, and working with my hands. Also, the California College of Arts was very much about um, craftsmanship at that time. We still had glass blowing um, there at the college and ceramics. So I was very surrounded by all of these art genres and people working with their hands and making stuff by hand. Um, so my work is very in. Um, my work is very intuitive, allowing each piece to come together as naturally as possible um, while conveying the spirit and strength of femininity. My passion is alchemy, transformation, and human emotion. So I wanted to show like a little collection of work that I've done. And earlier in my career and, and still, I make books. So one of the ways I'm able to keep up with myself and all of my inspirations is to put them together in book formats, which is helpful for me. So this was a book called The Name of the White Flower is Jasmine, and it was about my poetry and um, homeless people that I met over a period of time. So um, I was writing all the time and meeting people and photographing them. I was photographing, of course, using black and white film. Um, and I am a craftsman. So I was taking the pictures. I was developing the film. I was printing the pictures, the contact sheets, um, and collecting them. In about 2008, I was in a show in Philly uh, at a little boutique at a, at a store on Second Street. And I was introduced to a woman um, named Liz Calagris, and she fell in love with my work. She said it spoke to her in ways um, that she couldn't even really express. So she um, led me into a, a grant that was from the Catherine Alexander Foundation, and I was awarded this grant. And my figurative work was uh, curated into an exhibition, um, and it also had a song called In My Body. There was a spoken word performance that went along with the show. Uh, and it, it was like, incredible. Mixed media, mixed artists. Um, so In My Body took its seeds from a nonprofit collaborative multi-arts project conceived by Liz Calagris in Philadelphia in 2010. The project included an exhibition featuring Leah McDonald's encaustic photos of nude women, a body image workshop and roundtable, 
two performances directed by Melanie Stewart. A stage reading was held at Christ Church Neighborhood House in Philadelphia. Excerpts from the show were performed at the 2014 National Undergraduate Conference on Body Image at Cabrini College in October of 2014. In May 2015, a five-day workshop was held at the Arden Theater's Hamilton Arts Annex. Um, so this is a little blur from the show I'd like to share. I was um, also in 2016 asked to contribute my artworks of the, of the human body, the female figure, to the set of a musical produced based on the emotions and threads of my figurative artwork. So for many of us, the daily task of living within our own bodies is at once natural and confusing. From the daily reminders each morning when a pair of jeans no longer fits the right way, to the anxiety that it can accompany the purchase of a new swimsuit, the way we look at our body and how it behaves makes up a large part of how we see ourselves as people. A three-part art exhibition, a project at the Catherine Alexander Foundation takes a look at this relationship and tries to help us understand the complexities. This is a little video of me in the studio. I'm going to go into um, some more explanation about how I actually create my artworks, but this piece was created um, in conjunction with the In My Body show. So I'm gonna show it now and kind of entice you into my processes. So I'm definitely a photographer. Um, I've been a photographer since I can remember, but I'm also an artist and very drawn to mixed media. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit um, or a couple paragraphs from a statement that I actually had a friend write for me who's uh, an amazing writer, Kirsten Kashok. She teaches at Drexel and she's written many books and. Um, I love her words. I think it describes my art. So I'm gonna kind of go back and forth between these words and some pictures that I've made, and then I'm gonna lead you into my process. McDonald's work abstracts through the creation of palimpsests, like viewing the interior of a house through gauze or the next page of a book through a vellum layer of handwriting. Emphasis is achieved through mystery, shadow, hiddenness. It should come as no surprise that McDonald is also a bookmaker. Her love of paper, texture, and language are underscored in that work. What narrative is present in her images has this sense of bookness. Her images can seem singular pages of fleeting beauty taken from some dark fable. Her images have stories that range before and after these moments and those stories are somehow contained within the single image. If, as Diane, Diane Arbus once said, a photograph is a secret about a secret, then McDonald's work is a secret upon a secret. The levels interact to comment on one another 
and the interplay between them can be harmonious or dissonant, obscuring or revelatory. So here are some of my um, works from the female fairy tale. Here are some works from Soliloquy. Um, here are some more recent works of, with black and white photographs and encaustic painting. Here are some, also some recent works. In recent pieces where pattern work is foregrounded, the material becomes insistent. The viewer begins to notice the wax to question its relationship to the subject matter. What is the connection between human flower and bee? The producer of the wax McDonald uses called to mind through hexa hexagonal patterning. Is it the bee who travels between flowers, reproducing them, but also harvesting pollen for its own use? So does McDonald reproduce these subjects, flowers and the female form, and in the process seems to steal material for her own mysterious purpose. McDonald uses both chemical and physical processes in her art. She photographs, she collages, she paints with oils and wax, she marks her images, sometimes scars them. But this making art upon art, she does with the sensitivity of a poet. She is not about destruction, but about extraction. She brings to the surface the worlds that hide within and behind. This is already an interior world, a dreamt world, an elusive world half remembered, available to multiple interpretations, never fully grasped. Figure and flower, photograph and wax, McDonald's hybrid art makes space for the in-betweenness of experience. We are neither one thing nor another, not fully our past and its traumas, not fully the beauty we seek. We are all of these, accreted layer by layer over years, and we are the space between. So these are the pieces that are currently in the exhibition, Poised and Forceful, and they were curated by Claire. And I was asked to make them very large, 48 by 60. And I do really embrace the challenge of making very large scale photographs uh, um, with encaustic. I absolutely love it. It is challenging. <laughs> it is hot. It is exhausting. Um, it's very labor intensive in my process, right? And so scraping, brushing, scraping um, to create these layers. So. I like to talk about my work as a marriage between two organic and al alchemistic processes, photography and encaustic. I rely on the transformation of materials caused by heat, light, energy, chemicals, and pigments. Abstraction, of course, we know is the quality of dealing with ideas rather than events and our freedom from represent representational qualities in art. Um, one of my biggest inspirations was, of course, Ansel Kiefer because of the amazing texture and fearlessness of using materials. So mixing tar or aluminum or hot metal, uh, uh, literal content as well as zero content, like total abstraction. So my process is this, right? So I photograph, I print, I collage, I do an underpainting, which includes maybe charcoal drawing, gessoing using sandpaper. Then I do wax medium, then I collage. And I just took advantage of the slide and sort of this sort of in, intense, saturated word block, right, of repetition and addition and subtraction. So at any point, I could have put pluses in here and then also maybe minuses, like taking away layers, taking away wax medium, taking away painting, right? And then reapplying, right? So uh, I do really evoke this, this intuitive, I don't know where I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> and then I go and then I'm, I'm taking this away. I'm, I'm taking this back, I'm pulling back, I'm, I'm, ta I'm taking it off. So here are, um, some images I'm gonna share of, of the actual pieces I made for the show being created. Um, so I, I sectioned the large photograph um, into panels and glued them down. Of course, I wanted to remind everybody that I am a large format view camera photographer. 
So this is like a ridiculous photo, but I actually do have this camera. It's the Toyo uh, four, four by five. And I would carry it around with a very heavy tripod and shoot one single framed four by five Tri-X slide at a time. Um, I also was a huge fan of Polaroid Type 55 film, which is no longer even being manufactured. Um, and in the last, I would say, maybe 10 years, I've really um, had to sort of evolve from the darkroom processes um, of alchemy and um, chemicals and heat and developing film and printing to this world of digital photography. And of course, the Epson 3880 has been a wonderful machine for me. And I've been very fortunate to be sponsored by Hanna Mule Paper Company. So really, just I feel blessed to use those papers and to be able to recreate my black and white images um, in this way, right? So I might scan prints that I had once created in the darkroom or scan negatives um, from the camera. So the underpainting for me it, it is like initiation maybe for the photograph to transform, to begin this very transformative process of becoming a painting. Um, I, I might get rid or scar or cut the photographs. And um, I, I think that a very important thread exists in my work and that is um, you know, emotion. Um, and here is a little video, I'm gonna show you a little video of how I construct um, and manipulate the photos. Hi, um, I wanted to share um, the construction and process of this very large encaustic photo piece that I'm working on. Um, I'm having a show at Parktown Gallery um, on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, these beautiful galleries in um, Philly that's opening up June 29th. So I'm working on 48 um, by 60 wood panel. It's a cradle panel. I have it here on my sawhorses. And what I decided to do was um, section the panel into 16 by 20 segments in order to um, glue it successfully onto this large um, wood panel. So you can see there's like different um, pieces. One, two, I think there's nine, right? So each one is 16 by 20. I printed them on this uh, 188 photo rag, the Hanamule, and I hand pour the edges. Um, I kind of like that they're not cookie cutter perfect. And, you know, there's a little spaces in between. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is just go around and make sure that nothing is lifting up. Um, and if it is, I'm just gonna tack it down with a little bit of extra glue. I did use the PVA glue. Um, made by Lineco and the, the adhesive and I used the foam roller um, and you know rolled the glue onto the back and then glued them on. So now I'm just sanding, right? I always like to use a little bit of sandpaper um, on the panels and sand um, the sort of paper flaps down and also just add uh, a little bit of texture um, with the grit of the sand table just kind of lightens it and it makes me feel like it's just more cohesive before I go ahead and add the layer of wax medium. And then I'm gonna start adding um, the colors that are already in the piece. And this is interesting too because this is a pre-existing um, finished encaustic photo that I scanned and reprinted. So that's kind of another um, just interesting fact about these, these works and I'm making four of them. So I'll try to show in the video the four different pieces as I progress, and I'm going to make these pieces in the next two weeks. So I'll keep you posted. Okay, thanks. So after I do that whole process and draw and sand, I start with um, my wax medium. And it's always fun, I think, for people that are unfamiliar with encaustic to kind of see it and to learn about it. Um, it is a beautiful beautiful medium. Okay, so the word encaustic originates from the Greek word encaustikos, which is also the name 
of the paint company that I use their paint who sponsored me to do an amazing residency at the Encaustic Castle. And I studied with um, Patricia Sedgebrook there who is an incredible encaustic artist. And I'm really a self-taught encaustic artist. Um, they don't give MFAs for encaustic painting. Um, so, and I also, I'm a photographer, right? So I really have been learning and studying and learning and practicing encaustic um, for years. And it started very simply with that poured process that I showed earlier in the slideshow over the photos. And the more I've learned, the more I've been able to evolve in the medium, right? So encausticos, the word means to burn in, and this element of heat is necessary for a painting to be called encaustic. It's a combination of pigment, beeswax, and resin that can be melted and brushed, smoothed with an iron, or drawn into and sculpted in three-dimensional form. So Jasper Johns, I feel like when he added encaustic to his work in the 70s, sort of made a resurgence of the work. And I find that it's getting more popularity all the time as people are dealing with this sort of digital era of art and working on a computer, which I find very limiting. So working with your hands is very important to me and working in these layers, I also think is really beautiful. Um, I like to make fun stencils and this is like a masking technique that I do to um, combine, get the layers to combine, right? So when they're, so to sort of buzz them and, and make, encourage them to merge. Encaustic also involves heat. And so I use a blowtorch. Uh, I'll just show you here what that actually looks like and sounds like. So I'm using the heat here. I'll turn it down a little bit. I'm using the heat here to fuse these layers and textures of paint together. Right, and I think you already saw me use sandpaper and earlier you saw me use a razor blade. So it's a very, very physical process um, in terms of how it's applied and these layers are put together. Um, here are some interesting, I just wanted to show really the abstraction and I do balance these two worlds in my mind about reality, right, and fantasy. So the encaustic helps me cross, it's like a bridge that I cross over when I'm working. And the encaustic itself, the medium helps me, you know, make this voyage, right? Cross this bridge, it is the bridge, right? That takes me from reality in my photographs to these paintings. Um, I did spend a lot of time at the exhibit. And I really enjoyed, um, the grouping and being a part of the show. Um, I actually went with a friend at, uh, in the summertime and we did take these pictures. So I love the way it was curated, um, the sort of veiling of these large um, fabric pieces, you know, the sort of solid, heavy mixture of mediums in the ceramic pieces, of course, my work, Maureen's work. Um, the light in the spaces, it was just so beautiful. Um, and I think it turned out amazing. So these are just some in, in interior shots of the exhibition um, and through the window um, of my work and other artists work in the show. I think that wraps up my slideshow. Let me see. That's it, you guys. I can stop my share. That's my slideshow. So hopefully that gives you a little idea about how I make these things happen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leah. Um, so, and Maureen, of course, uh, I am turning on. Oh, you guys could see my desktop, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I am turning on the ability for the audience to turn their own microphones on um, in case they have questions for Leia or, or Maureen, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. That, that should be a button on the bottom uh, left-hand corner of your screen uh, and ask questions yourself. Um, I do have a, a couple that were submitted uh, for both of you and, and so I'll start off, but you know, for the audience, feel free to jump in when, when you see fit. Um, so a, a question 
for Leah, um, do you always use photographs that you have taken yourself? Um, and do you have any interest in, in using found content, um, you know, whether it's from a magazine or just a, another artist's photography? That's a great question. And actually, um, one of the things about my work, and I think you will notice this from the slideshow, is it's, it's gone through a lot of changes. I mean, from where I've started with photojournalism and very realistic photos to the type of work I'm doing now. And I've been having a lot of gratitude about that transformation and feeling like looser, maybe more comfortable uh, in my body and more um, imaginative. Right. So I think when you're able to really tap into your imagination, it's a powerful thing. So having stability and imagination is, is incredible. Um, I generally my whole life photograph people. I mean, it's like I might take them like scout locations. I mean, if I told you how many photo photographs I have and how many photo shoots I've done, you, you I mean, you can't it, it's too much. It's too much. I mean, it's addicting in photography. You're always having ideas. You're always doing a photo shoot. You're like, let's go, this, let's do this. Right. So yeah, I created all my own images. Um, lately though, I really wanted to have other elements, specific elements in my shots. And I've considered using clouds, fields, uh, trees, you know, certain things with my pictures to even go further into that surrealism. Right. So work like um, uh, Jerry Yulesman, for example, right, who composited like six or seven images at a time. That's what I'm thinking about now. Um, and I can't do that, you know, with film. And I'm not a digital artist. So I have to try to figure out how to do these things by hand. And that's a possibility. Great. Um, so Maureen, there was a, a question you, you talked about mineral aggregates in, in your work. And I, I think that that's where um, the metal pieces meet the painting. And if you could explain a little bit about what those are and, and you know, what material is it, what minerals is it, you know, in that process? Yes. So that's a very, very good question, Claire, because they form a, a substantial um, a, a component of my work. So I discovered many years ago, it's probably about, uh, I, I would say at least 15 years ago, um, golden, golden companies, um, mineral mediums. So uh, Golden at that time had quite a selection. They, they've reduced a, a few things down now, but they use crushed minerals such as pumice, alumina, mica, um, in, in various grades of fine to, to very coarse uh, in uh, an acrylic vehicle or carrier. And uh, when, they, when you apply them, basically the, the shrinkage occurs naturally with the carrier and you are left with a, a, a kind of um, a free form uh, a ghost of a, a sort of stone-like um, or, or as I like to think of them, uh, kind of paleolithic material effects. And why, why I enjoy so much working with them is they're wonder, not only are they luscious in a very austere way in their own right, but they're a wonderful bridging and, and transitional material between different other families of materials. And as you can see from the work that I'm currently doing now, they form the kind of ideal, not only physical, but metaphorical um, transitionary material between um, metal and soft, the soft surfaces of wood and the fluid, uh, the fluid uh, residue of different forms of painting. And not only, and they're, they're very flexible in the fact that they can be view, mixed with um, very thickly and uh, coarsely, or they can be, uh, they it can be used to create as in my mineral threads, a very, very fine, but also um, a very um, severe, sublime kind of, um, play on, on a textile using stones. I love the idea of using uh, stone thread work where the threads, instead of being soft and malleable, you know, are um, uh, wed to the earth. And I have to say that in my travels, especially in, in um, the Himalayas, I, this kind of um, affinity for materials 
really took hold where I saw uh, in infinite permutations, but always very profound ones, the interface between um, materials in extremis, uh, not only atmospherically and, and, and meteorologically, but physically between the stone and the uh, conglomerations of different types of rock and um, as they interface with very either fine uh, streams or great torrents that moved boulders around. So I wanted to capture that kind of, um, I guess, uh, dialogue of, of material extremis within my work. And uh, these mediums really just were what I was looking for. So does, I hope that answers a little bit of the question. <laughs> It was a beautiful answer, no matter what. It was beautiful. <laughs> and you use the word you, bridge. You use you use the I talked about the bridge too. You use the bridge. Well, there we go. There you go. <laughs> so we do have a, a question for both of you. Um, you know, you you both of you are, are so material based. Um, Leia with the, the soft wax and Marie with the hard metal. Um, you know, it, is there a, a single word that you would describe? to represent your relationship with that material. So why don't we start with Leia? You know, I, I've <laughs> always been, <laughs> well, first I was gonna say, can I say two? Sure. Uh, so one is the humble, one, one is humble, I, and one is obsessed. Because I, I think through, because I'm humble, like it's a balance, like I'm, I'm like driven to it, and I get in there and I, I, I want to just do it all. And then I, I have to like step away and be gentle and be humble and, and respectful. Right. So it, it's like a, it's like a dry, mm -hmm. a, you know, I don't know how else to describe it. It, it. Both. I'd say humble and obsessed. And then for Maureen, do you have a word or, or two words to describe your relationship with uh, metal? I have one word, and it's the word that I used for my Fulbright project. And it's mm -hmm. it's it's it takes several words to translate it from the Sanskrit to <laughs> English. But the word, and it's a very profound word. Uh, it's part of a, uh, a duality, and the word is prakriti. And prakriti's uh, complementary word is purusha. And in in Indian or Vedic cosmology, prakriti refers to uh, not only the materiality of life in the universe, but the creative force that shapes it. Now, its complementary constituent is Purusha, which is roughly translated as the soul or spirit. And interestingly enough, these two words, uh, words are further associated with the masculine and the feminine. So Purusha associated with the male principle it is potentiality, it is spirit, it is soul, but it is only a potentiality. It is nothing without the uh, manifestation and realization that is provided through Prakriti, the materiality of the cosmos, mm -hmm. which not only gives it form, but shapes it and brings it to life. Well, that makes so, you feel humble. Uh, and that, that is when you think about the cosmos, yeah, that's well, that's, you know, that's what I do. And, and, and property is associated with the female principle. So interestingly enough, in Asian cultures, and it's associated with the color red, mm -hmm. property is associated with the, the female or left hand. So that um, it's associated also with the sense of power that only women have and the feminine have, which is called Shakti. So that in the linguistics of Asia, Shakti not only stands for the feminine and associated powers, but it also translates simply as power. The word for power in Asia is Shakti, which basically means female, which is very ironic <laughs> considering, considering the ambivalent associations and situations in which that half of humanity finds itself in all parts of the world, but in that part of the world has its own, uh, you know, particular challenges. So, um, so that, yes, that is the, that is the word that I would use for what it, what it is that inspires me and for which I, in, in which I am embedded. Mm, I love it. What a great answer. Um, mm -hmm. 
before moving on to the next question, someone from the audience pointed out um, that both of you use fire in your practice, uh, but also there's videos of you using fire um, in your presentations, um, you know, and what a, a fun connection that is. Um, that's great. We were, we were talking before the presentations about, you know, everyone loves fire. It's some intrinsically human. They do. Thing. They do. Yeah. <laughs> they do. <laughs> um, Pyromania. <laughs> yeah, I to, um, about scale, and, and I was wondering a lot of a lot of scale related questions as well. Um, and the questions for both of you, but I, I'm going to ask it a little step differently. Um, so, Leah, for your work that's in the show for Poison Forceful, this seems like a, a much larger scale than you normally work at. Um, you know, and, and did you like working at the scale? Did you miss kind of the intimacy of, of your smaller works? Um, you know, and if you had any thoughts about that. Um. I th I think the thing about m my work is it is it's so out of control. It's beyond my um, control. I, I don't know where I'm going. I I'm fully uh, humbled and and almost helpless in the process at times. With all, even with all my knowledge of encaustic and layering and color, I'm following an unreined horse, like a wild, a wild horse. And a lot of my pieces are unsuccessful, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm marrying these, all these, these elements and this intuition and this activity and passion and, and material. So, and heat, like the heat gets too much. I over melt it. I hate it. I have to scrape. It doesn't look like it. It looks terrible. I have to scrape it. The color's all wrong. It, it, it's like, where did the photo go? I can't find anything. I mean, there's so many desperate, like just forlorn, lost moments in my process. And then, you know, so I make, you know, even if I work every day, I make how many truly successful pieces. I mean, that's sort of, I've always liked those high risk experiences, right? So I liked shooting the Polaroid Type 55. You would buy a box, you would shoot all day. The model would be crying, you'd be exhausted. You might get one image. You know, it, 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 was, it was beyond my control. Like I did everything right and it still didn't look, it didn't turn out. Right, so the same with the, the marrying of the photo and the wax. And so when I knew, when you curated me, that the pieces had been successful, when I knew that I could work on them small, when I knew the elements and the composition and the spatial relationships and the color, then I could fearless, confidently go into the large size. I, I could much more physically and emotionally connect to I mean, you could, we could have gone bigger. Like I could have, I could have done it. I could have reenacted it, right? So this is really how I work in repetition of from, from editing, because there's so many processes that are so important from taking the picture, right? And then it's sort of like the, this funneling, like I take 500 pictures, I edit to one. I take that one into production. I print it multiple times. I paint them. I look at them, I edit them, then I take them maybe further into, so there's this like, right? It, process of creation, elimination, creation, elimination. So where we met and where the show happened was the perfect point. Very, very similar to how the Wexler show happened. Like I had been photographing all of these women, hundreds of women who'd suffered trauma and had body issues. And then I was funneled into this curation process and then I was easily able to produce the work. Does that make sense? But there is this land of, of the cosmos of this infinite number of possibilities, right? And combinations, they're like mathematical equations that, that, that have to occur to get to one that works. Great, thank you. Um, and so Maureen, I don't think of your, your work as small at all. Um, your, to me, your work is, is on the larger scale, but certainly, compared to the work of, of the masters that you learn from, you know, your, your work is much more of a humble size. Um, you know, and if you do ever get the, the yearning of making, you know, work that big where it's just monolithic, or if you kind of like the scale that you're working on, or, or do you even have a, a temptation to go smaller? You know, that's an interesting question, Claire, because uh, first of all, to create these large colossal forms, the, the, obviously they're a composite, um, create, you really do require uh, a fully staffed, fully competent um, support atelier. And 
uh, the name wars that I work with, they are uh, deeply embedded in a traditional world. In fact, when I first started working with this free hammering to, um, to evoke organic forms, living forms, moving forms, uh, they, were, uh, they were really intrigued because nobody had ever used their techniques and their tools to uh, evoke that kind of form before. They were very tightly wedded to the iconographic because their raison d'etre is to create images of the gods, which are strictly, very strictly circumscribed, um, you know, for obvious divine reasons. So um, there are really issues of weight, material cost. Uh, I have entertained doing larger works, but I would say um, maybe, maybe no more than perhaps possibly twice or three times the size of the dimension that I'm working on now. But those will be very dependent upon grant support for a variety of strategic uh, reasons. Uh, but I, will, I don't have any inclination to, to fully depart into a, um, into a fully sculptural world because what really intrigues me about the metal is, uh, uh, and perhaps here I can provide a little backstory that'll basically just really answer the larger question. When I first first thought of, conceived of this idea of a synthesis, it was when I was first in Nepal in 2005 and I first beheld these beautiful, um, opulent um, Reikwase works uh, of gods and goddesses that graced the architecture of the valley. Many of these were several centuries old or 500 years old or older. And in the process, because they had once been fire gilded, the gold had gradually been worn away and left almost as like tissues gracing their sur the surface of the forms and the underlying copper being subjected to the, um, to the elements um, had basically now turned into a, a full range of uh, almost painterly colors. So that with the flickering surfaces of the gold tissues and the opulence of the patinas suddenly suggested it to me as a painting, which I knew it wasn't clearly, but then, of course, you know, when you drop a seed inside, you know, your brain, the brain takes over in its spare time. And in a short, you know, in a short bit, I had started to give a, a serious thought to what it would be like to possibly marrying this medium with what a painting. And there was a lot of argumentation that I experienced internally about this. And so that's when I undertook my self funded feasibility study. And I was, I, I will say quite frankly, I was shamefully hubristic about that attempt because I thought, oh, hammering metal, how hard could it be? And suffice it to say that my first experience, I was like crying in my pillow for about two days. Because as it is, as the late Mary Slusser referred to it, it is the art of the coniagenti, because it is infinitely more complex and demanding than lost wax casting of metals, which by which you have various steps where you can do control. It's unforgiving metal on metal. If you don't know what, you, what you're what you doing, get out is basically what it is. So, um, so just, the, the, just the, the immersion within that the practice itself uh, taught me so much about the forming of the metal, but it also, it also introduced me to a kind of, uh, when I work on the, when I work on repoussé in this context of this synthesis, the copper starts to become for me a form of living skin. It has to be heated up, it has to be coddled. Um, I find myself endlessly caressing it while I'm working on it because part of running my hand over the surface gives me feedback as to is, is the work, is, does, is the work sufficiently alive for me or does it need more heavy breathing and more fire and, and, and energy placed into it. So uh, I find so much, I derive so much pleasure from, from this level of work, which I really feel I'm only beginning to kind of scratch the surface, that at least at this time, I have no aspirations for working large for just simply the sake of working large. It has to be, it has to be, there has to be a reason for me to go in that direction. And I'm also so enjoying really exploring these new mediums and materials uh, and the way they can really successfully integrate the whole incongruity of these materials as they mass up 
on a substrate is something that I find just really aesthetically and viscerally appealing. You know, there, there's, there's not a point in going big just for the sake of going big, it sounds like for you. No, and I've seen some large works and if they're not done well, the one thing about working large is large scale really reveals, uh, 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 it, it reveals a lack of knowledge and uh, flaws and inadequacy. And it's, you know, you, the bigger you go, the more, the more you better know. Bigger isn't stuff. better. B yeah, yeah big, bigger isn't better is what I'm going to take away. No. If you're going to go big, go, go planned. Well, I think that's a, a great place to stop for tonight. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Leah McDonald and Maureen Durdak for thank you. Tonight. Thank you so much to Part Town Place for for helping us put on this talk and bringing both of your works together with four other amazing artists for the show Poised and Forceful. Um, and again, I hope that you guys can take a nice walk on the parkway and and see mm -hmm. the exhibition for yourself from outside.